U.S. President-elect Donald Trump says that relations with Russia need to be, quote, straightened out. Russian President Vladimir Putin says his country is, quote, ready to cooperate. But from the battle against ISIS to Russia's seizure of Crimea and stance towards NATO, what that apparent agreement actually means is far from clear. Joining us now from Washington, D.C., with a perspective on the Kremlin, Dmitry Trenin, author of Should We Fear Russia? He's the director of the Carnegie Moscow Center. And uh, Mr. Trenin, we welcome you to TVO tonight. Let me uh, practice a couple of words of Russian on you and just say, Zdrasvoyte, как tila? Dila neplocha. Thank you very much. Not bad. <laughs> nice to, not bad. Thank you very much. There were reports that champagne corks were popping in the Kremlin on the news that Donald Trump had won the election and defeated Hillary Clinton. In your judgment, why the jubilation? Well, in reality, there was applause on the Duma floor, the Duma being the lower house of the Russian parliament. Uh, I don't think that they were celebrating Donald Trump's victory as much as the defeat of Hillary Clinton. Clinton and Obama were seen largely in, 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 in a very negative light by the Russian elite, by the Russian political class. Donald Trump was an unknown quantity, and uh, but he was preferable to more of the same, more old, more of the old stuff, and and I think as far as the Kremlin was concerned, there was a, a real uh, concern that uh, the U.S.-Russian relationship was on a trajectory leading to a kinetic collision. So Donald Trump's victory at least gave a sigh of relief. Do you have any sense of what Putin truly thinks of Trump? I don't. Uh, except for Putin, no one does. <laughs> but uh, I would say that uh, he, is, uh, he is open to uh, a serious conversation with the new American president. I think he is uh, getting ready for that first encounter. He is ready to use all the openings that he may find in Donald Trump. Uh, he looks uh, a very different president from all his predecessors, many predecessors, in fact. And uh, something just might be possible with him that has eluded Putin with his predecessors. Let me quote one of your colleagues at the Carnegie Moscow Center. This is Alexander Baunov, who wrote last month, Trump and Putin have very different personalities. Where Trump is beaming and boisterous, Putin is quiet and collected. A Russian charismatic leader in the Byzantine tradition is allowed secrecy and enigma and must be, on some level, a messenger from heaven. But the two men also have a lot in common. Both are unhappy with the modern global order and the direction it is going. Both dislike domestic and global elites and despise political correctness. And finally, both of them are masters at crossing invisible red lines. I'm wondering how dangerous can the world get with leaders of the United States and Russia both having a predilection for wanting to cross red lines? Well, I think that some red lines uh, actually put you in a cage. A cage is also, you know, something that uh, constrains your movement and does not allow you to, uh, to do what often is necessary for you. I'm not talking about either Putin or Trump. Uh, I think that Putin and Trump um, are nationalists, essentially. The irony of Trump is that you have an American nationalist who has taken on the U.S.-inspired and U.S.-dominated uh, globalism. Um, and that, I think, makes him, uh, um, in a way, um, a, a, a personality, a person who is um, on the same side as Vladimir Putin, a fellow nationalist. And if they've managed to, uh, um, to reach some sort of an accord based on their understanding of respectively U.S. and Russian interests, uh, we might not necessarily live in a more dangerous world. Let me say that uh, just a couple of months ago, I was very worried that the United States and Russia would start shooting down each other's planes over Syria. And that would have been, uh, as you can imagine, a real disaster. That seems less likely to happen now. Is that fair to say? Well, that's my judgment. Okay. Let's talk about the WikiLeaks business. Uh, we want to play here a clip of a recent statement by Mike Rogers, 
the director of the National Security Agency, in response to a question about the source of the information that was released by WikiLeaks. Here's the clip. There shouldn't be any doubt in anybody's mind. This was not something that was done casually. This was not something that was done by chance. This was not a target that was selected purely arbitrarily. This was a conscious effort by a nation state to attempt to achieve a specific effect. Do you think he's right about that? Well, I think he's basically right. Although, of course, uh, neither of us has the proof that who it actually was. And I don't think that's, that's that important. I think what is important is that um, it's interesting. If you look at this situation from a Russian perspective, then uh, you wonder why should, the United, should people in the United States be so worried about? Everyone gets into everyone else's business these days. The Russians would say that the United States has been involved in uh, other people's business uh, very deeply and for a very long time. And now it's the United States that's the target, so no one is an exception to the rule. Um, we're all quits. Um, so what's, what's, what's the part? Why the fuss? Do you expect that the Americans will try to respond in some way to this? Well, I think they will, and I think they have been. Look, uh, the United States uh, has been very deeply involved in the affairs of uh, the former Soviet Union, including in Russia, uh, including in Ukraine. And that's part of, that's part of uh, international relations today. Uh, whether they will respond with, uh, um, with specific attacks against specific targets in Russia, they might. I think that the Russians will take that uh, um, as uh, just another step in this um, information warfare that's been going on for some time. Uh, nothing really special. Russians generally do not feel themselves uh, invulnerable to attacks of this kind, unlike many Americans. So this will continue, I think. I just wonder where we are these days on this front, given that the, who was it, the uh, German foreign intelligence chief warned not too long ago that cyber attacks aimed at political destabilization of his country, um, they should prepare themselves for it, given that there are elections coming up not too long from now. Does this feel like the new normal for you? Well, again, it's, it's, it's hard for me to comment on something so esoteric as, uh, as cyber attacks. No one really knows what's, what's ha who is doing what against whom. Uh, you can suspect people of, uh, of, uh, of, of something, but you c I, I don't think you can be totally sure. But uh, yes, I would say that in today's world, uh, this has become uh, the new normal. And uh, what we are witnessing is, uh, um, you know, a very, um, very uh, uh, intense um, warfare in uh, information space uh, between uh, the great powers. Uh, and Europe is often uh, one of the battlefields in that warfare. Well, I want to understand a little better what the new normal is, because certainly when I was a kid growing up here in the province of Ontario, we understood that the, that the, the Cold War, if you like, was essentially a conflict between the liberal capitalist West and the communist East. And I wonder what it is today. What do you think? Well, I think that uh, we just exited from a period that lasted about 25 years, uh, that featured for the first time in human affairs one nation that dominated uh, the entire world without um, anyone mounting a challenge against that nation. That's very atypical, very uncharacteristic uh, for world history. And now we have uh, that nation, the United States, still being dominant in the world, still, still being so much more superior to uh, most of it, to all of its rivals. But uh, these rivals are now challenging U.S. Uh, dominance. Uh, Russia is doing that more overtly. China is doing it less overtly. There are other challengers. And uh, in a way, this is back to, uh, to normalcy in international relations. You always have great powers and other powers 
vying for influence, vying for power, and that's, uh, that I think will continue. Let's consider how many friends Russia has right now. And to do that, I want to quote you when you write, Angela Merkel was right to say in 2014 that Vladimir Putin lives in a different world. How is the Russian world different from everybody else's? Well, I would say differently because what I meant in that quote was that Angela Merkel lives in a different world from Vladimir Putin and from most uh, people around the world. I would say that the Europeans have been living in a world uh, that's very different from the, from the rest of the world, that uh, this world is protected by U.S. power, by, US, uh, by the U.S. military. Uh, the Europeans are not doing strategic uh, things, strategic uh, foreign policy, strategic defense policy. This is all done uh, under U.S. leadership within NATO. Um, and in that world, uh, you know, rules are observed, especially among the European countries. It's a rule-based uh, rules part of the world. You look elsewhere. You look at Russia. You look at China. You look at India. You look at the United States. Uh, they live in a different part of the world. They live in a world where armies are sent to fight and kill and take uh, casualties, where territory is seized, where countries are occupied, where international law is uh, not always honored, let's put it that way, or challenged. And this is a very different world from the world in which Mrs. Merkel lives. Well, let's stay with the year 2014 and consider the ramifications after the Russian invasion of Crimea and the subsequent takeover and annexation of it and the sanctions that then came. Uh, you wrote, ordinary Sergeys and Natalias discovered that they were Russians. What did you mean by that? Well, I think that uh, in, the, in the happier period of Russian-Western relations that lasted uh, through the 1990s and the 2000s and right up until the Ukraine crisis, uh, the uh, middle classes in uh, the larger towns, cities uh, around Russia were thinking of becoming a part of the global middle class. Uh, they would be able to travel around the world. They would be able to buy things that uh, came from, uh, from around the world. And they, they watched films produced uh, around the world, and they thought that they were just, you know, individuals in, in this globalized world. Uh, but uh, uh, come uh, 2014, come uh, Crimea, come Ukraine, come sanctions. And then they um, all of a sudden discover that uh, they are part of a collective, i.e. the Russian people, who are, who are subjected to a set of restrictions, to a set of uh, uh, sanctions. And uh, they feel that, uh, uh, well, somehow uh, they are not simply individuals. They are part of a, of a larger group called the Russian people. Hmm. And this is something that Mr. Putin has been using uh, very uh, expertly, uh, very successfully in his attempt to increase the cohesion, the domestic cohesion within Russia and uh, get more support for his policies, both domestic and foreign. You've made many fascinating observations, if I may say, in your book, Should We Fear Russia? But I want to put this one to you, uh, saying that Russia can only be governed with at least two thirds popular support, as opposed to America, where there are, of course, quite accustomed to having 51-49 support, but you've said 51-49 support is an invitation to civil war in Russia. Why the difference? Well, I think there's a, there's a, there's a vast difference uh, in terms of political culture. Uh, Russia's political culture is, um, I would say, much harsher than America's. Uh, when Russians fight, uh, they fight uh, to defeat the opponent, and sometimes to kill the opponent. It's, it's pretty strange for the Russians to observe people calling each other names uh, from the platforms during a, an election campaign. And when the campaign is done, uh, they all hug one another, and they all call each other one another friends and uh, serve in one another one another administrations and as if they had not said those things as if they had not meant them seriously in russia um, relations are very much 
relations among people uh, take uh, precedence over other things. And if you call somebody a liar, that will stick. And you will never say, well, I didn't really mean it, or, you know, times have changed, a few months, you know, it's a different... That, that's, that's, not, uh, that, that's not the situation, uh, that, that's not the, 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 the social environment in Russia. So if uh, you have a, a serious split within society, it often transforms in Russia, not in the fight between political parties in some sort of a political theater, but it translates into a war. And uh, Russia uh, has uh, had its uh, measure of uh, civic conflicts in the last century. Uh, and it's, it's not a country where uh, political leaders are changed through the ballot box every four or six years. It's a country, though, where the population uh, can bring down the entire state. Uh, and they did it actually twice, so 50 years uh, on average, every 50 years uh, in the 20th century. Hmm. Well, as we continue to consider how many friends Russia has in the world, I do want to remind you of something you said a few years ago when you said Russia will have to accept its de facto loneliness in this world. Do you think that's still the case? Uh, even more so than when I said it. Because? I think Russia, uh, because uh, Russia, let's say a few years ago, was still trying to be uh, part of something bigger part of uh, the enlarged West, this Euro-Atlantic area, uh, it failed uh, for, I think, very serious and important reasons. Um, I think it's now adjusted to uh, the situation in which uh, it is uh, a lone major power uh, that has its interests, that has its rivals, its opponents. There are certain, there are certain nations clinging to that power there are certain nations who are making friends with that power. There are many partners in the region. Again, uh, you look at, let's say, you look at the Middle East. It's, uh, it's, it's striking that Russia is on speaking terms with everyone, every single country, every single movement in the Middle East, except for ISIS and Nusra, hmm. maybe. Uh, you know, it's a country that, that's on best of terms with Israel and Iran at the same time, with Turkey and the Kurds, and shall I continue? They, there's not a single country in the region that uh, does not have a very um, active relationship with Russia. One of the most important achievements of Russia's foreign policy in the post-Soviet era has been the construction of a, uh, of a very solid relationship with China. And that matters a lot to the Russians. Well, this is all part of, I gather, Russia's trying to position itself as part of the global non-West. And I guess I want to know what makes any country want to be part of that club? Well, I would put things differently. Russia tried to become part of the West and it failed. And I think, again, that this failure was not accidental, was not something that was, was a result of a series of mistakes, mil miscalculations, whatever. Uh, Russia, in principle, does not, um, does not accept anyone's leadership over it. And this is, in my view, the most important reason why Russia failed in its attempt to be integrated into the West. Because the most important requirement for that integration was, is, and will be recognition of U.S. leadership in that part of the world. Now, the Russians simply cannot. They tried to accept U.S. leadership in the 1990s. Uh, it never worked. In the 2000s, they walked, walked away from that. Uh, so they, uh, they are unto themselves. They uh, will not be, uh, I don't think, uh, the dominant power in the former Soviet Union. They, their, their dominance uh, in the former USSR has been rejected by the countries uh, in the region. But at the same time, they uh, have been able to construct some fairly uh, pragmatic and f but fairly effective relationships with a number of non-Western countries. And, uh, you know, you deal with China, you deal with India, you deal with uh, 
with a host of countries in the Middle East. You deal with Korea, Japan, and Latin America, uh, lots of other countries. Uh, and that's, that, that's the world in which you live. The West is part of that world, uh, but it cannot expand, uh, uh, you know, uh, con indefinitely. I think the West has reached the ultimate uh, borders of its expansion, and Russia is, uh, is not there hmm. and will not be there. We've got less than five minutes to go, Mr. Trenton, and I want to put a couple of more items on the table here. First of all, this country, Canada, plans to send 450 soldiers to Latvia early next year as part of an effort by NATO to prevent a repeat of Russia's incursion in Ukraine elsewhere. And I wonder what you believe the Russian view of this military act to be. I don't think that the Russians uh, will take much notice, frankly. Um, but the, the truth is that the Russians have never intended um, or planned to reconquer, reoccupy uh, the Baltic states. It has not been uh, Russia's, uh, there's no reason, there's no interest for Russia to uh, occupy those lands. Ukraine is a, is, is, is a very special case uh, that uh, has no bearing on uh, the Baltic countries. But on the other hand, the dispatch of a fairly small uh, force uh, to Latvia will not provoke the Russians, I don't think, into doing something that would uh, escalate the situation. I hope that the Balts will be reassured, uh, the Russians uh, will not be provoked, and the Canadians will have good time in Latvia. You hope the Canadians will have a good time in Latvia, okay. Well, it's, it's, it's a nice country. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a country where I spent my honeymoon. I still remember that. <laughs> I'm glad you still remember that. Do you think Canada and Russia can continue to collaborate on issues such as the Arctic, which they share, um, and yet still disagree so significantly about Crimea? Well, they should. I, I don't think that Crimea will be recognized as part of Russia for a very long time by the West, or anyone for that matter. Uh, so we will, we will have to live with that. But that should not be an obstacle to collaborating on issues where Canadian and Russian interests uh, uh, coincide or come close. And the Arctic is something that uh, uh, a number of countries share. Russia and Canada have the largest, uh, 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 largest uh, exposure to the Arctic space. And uh, it's, they, they must, and I very much hope that uh, Russians will be able to learn a few things from Canadians, and maybe the Canadians will learn something from the Russians, and uh, the two will collaborate. Even though their, their, their views on other issues, such as Crimea, Ukraine, other issues, will be as opposed to each other as, as they are now. Well, there's one more thing I need to learn from you, and that is basically the answer to the question you pose in the title of your book. So answer it, please. Should we fear Russia? Uh, no, you should not, because this is irrational, doesn't lead to anything good. But you should handle Russia with care. Handle with care means what? Well, it means uh, make no illusions about the country. Uh, try to understand where Russia is coming from. Try to be um, humble in... Uh, in, uh, in, 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 in thinking about uh, other countries, uh, not uh, trying to impose your own, your own way of thinking uh, when you discuss other countries. Try to understand where all, where all, it, where all this is, uh, is originating from, including in the Ukraine crisis. Uh, because I think that what we are often um, fed is a, a, a very truncated and very um, distorted version of uh, what, what, what's happening uh, in various parts of the world because all these things are e exceedingly complex and it takes some time to understand uh, what uh, various parties try to achieve. But I think that basically uh, Russia is not a country to be feared but a country to be treated as a serious player with its own view of the world which does not necessarily, does not necessarily coincide with the view in the West. Does not, Russia does not buy Western values. I don't think there's any reason for the West to buy Russian values, but just recognize the diversity and proceed from that. Well, proceed from that uh, could mean something quite concerning, according to the Swedish Major General Anders Brandstrom, 
who said the global situation we are experiencing leads to the conclusion that we could be at war within a few years. In your judgment, what are the factors that could lead to the general's prediction coming true? Well, I think that uh, the Swedes have always uh, regarded Russia as a threat. And this comes, you know, this goes back to the uh, 18th and 16th, uh, 18th and 17th centuries. It's, 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 all, it's an old story. Um, they are a great country. They actually st helped start our statehood. The first uh, Russian uh, princes uh, were actually Swedish. So we have a very long-standing relationship with, with that country. But, uh, and Russia helped Sweden to divest itself of any illusions of being an empire, having defeated them in, in what's now Ukraine. But uh, to be more serious about it, or rather to be more direct in answering that question, I think that uh, the only way in which uh, we can come to blows is uh, through uh, miscalculation and, uh, um, and uh, mistake. And I, I said at the beginning of this uh, conversation that I feared, well, again, fear is a bad word, but I, I, I was very concerned that uh, Russia and the United States would uh, uh, come to blows, would be in a kinetic collision over Syria. Suppose uh, the no-fly zone that Hillary Clinton was proposing during the campaign were imposed. Mm -hmm. what, would, what would have happened? Uh, a Russian plane entering that zone? Would it be uh, shut down by the U.S.? Suppose it would be. Uh, would Russia desist from responding? Uh, my answer is no. And then it would be one, one each. So where do we go from here? Or in the Baltic space, uh, Baltic airspace, I'm not talking about Baltic states, I'm talking about the Baltic Sea, uh, those close encounters between uh, Russian and NATO planes uh, in the vicinity of Russian borders uh, could, uh, could lead, still could lead to uh, fatalities. Uh, and that is a, a very serious step toward, toward military confrontation. But there is no reason for either the West or Russia to actually uh, start a war. We're not, we're not in the Cold War environment, where it's a very different situation. When you, uh, when you adopt the Cold War analogy, that uh, makes you think in terms of, of developments which will never be repeated. And that will, uh, that will lead you to missing the things, the developments that will happen. So it's a very different world. We'll ha we, have to be, uh, we, we have to be aware of the differences between the situation then and now, even though the situation now sometimes could be more dangerous than the situation during uh, large uh, periods during the Cold War. Dmitry Trenin, we appreciate very much your time here on TVO tonight. You're the director of the Carnegie Moscow Center. Your book is called Should We Fear Russia? And let me just finish off by saying spasiba. Spasiba vam. Thank you very much. Merci bien. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.